The first Council of Nicaea was a council of Christian bishops convened in Nicaea in Bithynia by the Roman Emperor Constantine I in AD 325. This first ecumenical council was the first effort to attain consensus in the Church through an assembly representing all of Christendom. It was presided over by Hosius of Corduba, a bishop from the West. Its main accomplishments were settlement of the Christological issue of the nature of the Son of God and his relationship to God the Father. Overview The First Council of Nicaea was the first ecumenical council of the Church. Most significantly, it resulted in the first uniform Christian doctrine, called the Nicene Creed, with the creation of the Creed. A precedent was established for subsequent local and regional councils of bishops to create statements of belief and canons of doctrinal orthodoxy, the intent being to define unity of beliefs for the whole of Christendom. Derived from Greek, ecumenical means worldwide, but generally is assumed to be limited to the known inhabited earth and at this time in history is synonymous with the Roman Empire. The earliest extant uses of the term for a council are used by the life of Constantine, 3.6 around 338, which states, he convoked an ecumenical council, and the letter in 382 to Pope Damasus I and the Latin bishops from the First Council of Constantinople. One purpose of the council was to resolve disagreements arising from within the Church of Alexandria over the nature of the Son in his relationship to the Father, in particular, whether the Son had been begotten by the Father from his own being, and therefore having no beginning or else created out of nothing, and therefore having a beginning. Saint Alexander of Alexandria and Athanasius took the first position. The popular presbyter Arius, from whom the term Arianism comes, took the second. The council decided against the Arians overwhelmingly. Another result of the council was an agreement on when to celebrate Easter, the most important feast of the ecclesiastical calendar decreed in an epistle to the Church of Alexandria in which is simply stated, We also send you the good news of the settlement concerning the Holy Pash, namely that in answer to your prayers this question also has been resolved. All the brethren in the East who have hitherto followed the Jewish practice will henceforth observe the custom of the Romans and of yourselves and of all of us who from ancient times have kept Easter together with you. Historically significant is the first effort to attain consensus in the Church through an assembly representing all of Christendom. The Council was the first occasion where the technical aspects of Christology were discussed. Through it a precedent was set for subsequent general councils to adopt creeds and canons. This council is generally considered the beginning of the period of the first seven ecumenical councils in the history of Christianity. Character and Purpose The First Council of Nicaea was convened by Emperor Constantine the Great upon the recommendations of a synod led by Hosius of Cordoba in the Easter Tide of 325. This synod had been charged with investigation of the trouble brought about by the Ariane controversy in the Greek-speaking East. To most bishops, the teachings of Arius were heretical and dangerous to the salvation of souls. In the summer of 325, the bishops of all provinces were summoned to Nicaea, a place reasonably accessible to many delegates, particularly those of Asia Minor, Georgia, Armenia, Syria, Palestine, Egypt, Greece, and Thrace. This was the first general council in the history of the Church since the Apostolic Council of Jerusalem. The Apostolic Council having established the conditions upon which Gentiles could join the Church. In the Council of Nicaea, the Church had taken her first great step to define revealed doctrine more precisely in response to a challenge from a heretical theology. Attendees Constantine had invited all 1,800 bishops of the Christian Church, but a smaller and unknown number attended. 
Eusebius of Caesarea counted more than 250, Athanasius of Alexandria counted 318, and Eustathius of Antioch estimated about 270. Later, Socrates Scholasticus recorded more than 300, and of Agrius, Hilary of Poitiers, Jerome, Dionysius Exiguus, and Rufinus recorded 318. This number 318 is preserved in the liturgies of the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Coptic Orthodox Church of Alexandria. Delegates came from every region of the Roman Empire, including Britain. The participating bishops were given free travel to and from their episcopal sees to the council, as well as lodging. These bishops did not travel alone, each one had permission to bring with him two priests and three deacons. So the total number of attendees could have been above 1,800. Eusebius speaks of an almost innumerable host of accompanying priests, deacons and acolytes. The Eastern bishops formed the great majority. Of these, the first rank was held by the three patriarchs, Alexander of Alexandria, Eustathius of Antioch, and Macarius of Jerusalem. Many of the assembled fathers, for instance, Paphnutius of Thebes, Potamon of Heracli and Paul of Neo-Caesarea, had stood forth as confessors of the faith and came to the council with the marks of persecution on their faces. This position is supported by patristic scholar Timothy Barnes in his book Constantine and Eusebius. Historically, the influence of these marred confessors has been seen as substantial, but recent scholarship has called this into question. Other remarkable attendees were Eusebius of Nicomedia, Eusebius of Caesarea, the purported first church historian. Circumstances suggest that Nicholas of Myra attended, Aristakes of Armenia, Leontius of Caesarea, Jacob of Nisibus a former hermit, Hypatius of Gangra, Protogenes of Sardica, Malicious of Sebastopolis, Achius of Larissa and Spiridion of Trimithaus, who even while a bishop made his living as a shepherd from foreign places came John, Bishop of Persia and India, Theophilus, a Gothic bishop and Stratophilus, Bishop of Piscent of Georgia. The Latin-speaking provinces sent at least five representatives, Marcus of Calabria from Italia, Sicilian of Carthage from Africa, Hosius of Cordoba from Hispania, Nicosius of Di from Gaul, and Domnus of Striden from the province of the Danube, Athanasius of Alexandria, a young deacon and companion of Bishop Alexander of Alexandria, was among the assistants. Athanasius eventually spent most of his life battling against Arianism. Alexander of Constantinople, then a presbyter, was also present as representative of his aged bishop. The supporters of Arius included Secundus of Ptolemais, Theonus of Marmarica, Zedphirius, and Dads, all of whom hailed from the Libyan Pentapolis. Other supporters included Eusebius of Nicomedia, Paulinus of Tyrus, Actius of Lydda, Menophantus of Ephesus, and Theognus of Nicaea. Resplendent in purple and gold, Constantine made a ceremonial entrance at the opening of the council, probably in early June, but respectfully seated the bishops ahead of himself, as Eusebius described. Constantine himself proceeded through the midst of the assembly, like some heavenly messenger of God, clothed in raiment which glittered as it were with rays of light reflecting the glowing radiance of a purple robe, and adorned with the brilliant splendor of gold and precious stones. The emperor was present as an overseer and presider, but did not cast any official vote. Constantine organized the council along the lines of the Roman Senate. Hosius of Cordoba may have presided over its deliberations, he was probably one of the papal legates. Eusebius of Nicomedia probably gave the welcoming address. Agenda and Procedure The agenda of the Synod included the Ariane question regarding the relationship between God the Father and the Son, i.e., are the Father and Son one in divine purpose only or also one in being, the date of celebration of Pasha, Easter, the Meletian Schism, various matters of church discipline, which resulted in twenty canons, church structures, focused on the ordering of the episcopacy dignity of the clergy, 
issues of ordination at all levels and of suitability of behavior and background for clergy reconciliation of the lapsed, establishing norms for public repentance and penance readmission to the Church of Heretics and Schismatics, including issues of when reordination and or rebaptism were to be required liturgical practice including the place of deacons and the practice of standing at prayer during liturgy. The council was formally opened May 20 in the central structure of the imperial palace at Nicaea, with preliminary discussions of the Ariane question. In these discussions, some dominant figures were Arius, with several adherents. Some 22 of the bishops at the council, led by Eusebius of Nicomedia, came as supporters of Arius. But when some of them or shocking passages from his writings were read, they were almost universally seen as blasphemous. Bishops Theognis of Nicaea and Maris of Chalcedon were among the initial supporters of Arius. Eusebius of Caesarea called to mind the baptismal creed of his own diocese at Caesarea at Palestine as a form of reconciliation. The majority of the bishops agreed. For some time, scholars thought that the original Nicene Creed was based on this statement of Eusebius. Today, most scholars think that the creed is derived from the baptismal creed of Jerusalem, as Hans Lietzmann proposed. The Orthodox bishops won approval of every one of their proposals regarding the creed. After being in session for an entire month, the council promulgated on June 19 the original Nicene Creed. This profession of faith was adopted by all the bishops, but two from Libya who had been closely associated with Arius from the beginning. No explicit historical record of their descent actually exists. The signatures of these bishops are simply absent from the creed. Ariane Controversy the Arian controversy arose in Alexandria when the newly reinstated presbyter Arius began to spread doctrinal views that were contrary to those of his bishop, Saint Alexander of Alexandria. The disputed issues centered on the natures and relationship of God and the Son of God. The disagreement sprang from different ideas about the Godhead and what it meant for Jesus to be his son. Alexander maintained that the Son was divine in just the same sense that the Father is co-eternal with the Father, else he could not be a true son. Arius emphasized the supremacy and uniqueness of God the Father, meaning that the Father alone is almighty and infinite, and that therefore the Father's divinity must be greater than the Son's. Arius taught that the Son had a beginning, and that he possessed neither the eternity nor the true divinity of the Father, but was rather made God only by the Father's permission and power, and that the Son was rather the very first and the most perfect of God's creatures. The Arian discussions and debates at the Council extended from about May 20, 325, through about June 19. According to legendary accounts, debate became so heated that at one point, Arius was struck in the face by Nicholas of Myra, who would later be canonized. This account is almost certainly apocryphal, as Arius himself would not have been present in the council chamber due to the fact that he was not a bishop. Much of the debate hinged on the difference between being born or created and being begotten. Arians saw these as essentially the same. Followers of Alexander did not. The exact meaning of many of the words used in the debates at Nicaea were still unclear to speakers of other languages. Greek words like essence, substance, nature, person bore a variety of meanings drawn from pre-Christian philosophers which could not but entail misunderstandings until they were cleared up. The word homoousia, in particular, was initially disliked by many bishops because of its associations with Gnostic heretics, and because their heresies had been condemned at the 264-268 synods of Antioch. Arguments for Arianism According to surviving accounts, the presbyter Arius argued for the supremacy of God the Father, and maintained that the Son of God was created as an act of the Father's will, and therefore that the Son was a creature made by God, begotten directly of the infinite, eternal God. Arius's argument was that the Son was God's very first production, before all ages. 
the position being that the Son had a beginning, and that only the Father has no beginning, and Arius argued that everything else was created through the Son. Thus, said the Arians, only the Son was directly created and begotten of God, and therefore there was a time that he had no existence. Arius believed that the Son of God was capable of his own free will of right and wrong, and that, were he in the truest sense a son, he must have come after the Father, therefore the time obviously was when he was not, and hence he was a finite being, and that he was under God the Father. Therefore, Arius insisted that the Father's divinity was greater than the Son's. The Arians appealed to scripture, quoting biblical statements such as, The Father is greater than I, and also that the Son is firstborn of all creation. Arguments against Arianism The opposing view stemmed from the idea that begetting the Son is itself in the nature of the Father, which is eternal. Thus, the Father was always a Father, and both Father and Son existed always together, eternally, co-equally and consubstantially. The contrarian argument thus stated that the Logos was eternally begotten, therefore with no beginning. Those in opposition to Arius believed that to follow the Arian view destroyed the unity of the Godhead, and made the Son unequal to the Father. They insisted that such a view was in contravention of such scriptures as, I and the Father are one, and, the Word was God. As such verses were interpreted, they declared, as did Athanasius, that the Son had no beginning, but had an eternal derivation from the Father, and therefore was co-eternal with him, and equal to God in all aspects. Result of the debate the Council declared that the Son was true God, co-eternal with the Father and begotten from his same substance arguing that such a doctrine best codified the scriptural presentation of the Son as well as traditional Christian belief about him handed down from the Apostles. This belief was expressed by the bishops in the Creed of Nicaea, which would form the basis of what has since been known as the Nicene-Constantinopolitan Creed. Nicene Creed One of the projects undertaken by the Council was the creation of a creed, a declaration and summary of the Christian faith. Several creeds were already in existence, many creeds were acceptable to the members of the council, including Arius. From earliest times, various creeds served as a means of identification for Christians, as a means of inclusion and recognition, especially at baptism. In Rome, for example, the Apostles' Creed was popular, especially for use in Lent and the Easter season. In the Council of Nicaea, one specific creed was used to define the Church's faith clearly, to include those who professed it, and to exclude those who did not. Some distinctive elements in the Nicene Creed, perhaps from the hand of Hosius of Cordova, were added. Some elements were added specifically to counter the Arian point of view. Jesus Christ is described as God from God, light from light, true God from true God, proclaiming his divinity. Jesus Christ is said to be begotten, not made, asserting that he was not a mere creature, brought into being out of nothing but the true Son of God, brought into being, from the substance of the Father. He is said to be, of one being with the Father. Eusebius of Caesarea ascribes the term homo ausios, or consubstantial, i.e., of the same substance, to Constantine who, on this particular point, may have chosen to exercise his authority. The significance of this clause, however, is extremely ambiguous, and the issues it raised would be seriously controverted in the future. At the end of the creed came a list of anathemas, designed to repudiate explicitly the Arian's stated claims. The view that there was once that when he was not, was rejected to maintain the co-eternity of the Son with the Father. The view that he was mutable or subject to change was rejected to maintain that the son just like the father was beyond any form of weakness or corruptibility, and most importantly that he could not fall away from absolute moral perfection. Thus, instead of a baptismal creed acceptable to both the Arians and their opponents the council promulgated one which was clearly opposed to Arianism in, incompatible with the distinctive core of their beliefs.
The text of this profession of faith is preserved in a letter of Eusebius to his congregation, in Athanasius, and elsewhere. Although the most vocal of anti-Arians, the Homoousians, were in the minority, the creed was accepted by the council as an expression of the bishop's common faith and the ancient faith of the whole church. Bishop Hosius of Cordova, one of the firm Homoousians, may well have helped bring the council to consensus. At the time of the council, he was the confidant of the emperor in all church matters. Hosius stands at the head of the list of bishops, and Athanasius ascribes to him the actual formulation of the creed. Great leaders such as Eustathius of Antioch, Alexander of Alexandria, Athanasius, and Marcellus of Ancyra all adhered to the Homoousian position. In spite of his sympathy for Arius, Eusebius of Caesarea adhered to the decisions of the council, accepting the entire creed. The initial number of bishops supporting Arius was small. After a month of discussion, on June 19, there were only two left. Theonus of Marmarica in Libya, and Secundus of Ptolemais. Maris of Chalcedon, who initially supported Arianism, agreed to the whole creed. Similarly, Eusebius of Nicomedia and Theognis of Nice also agreed, except for the certain statements. The emperor carried out his earlier statement. Everybody who refused to endorse the creed would be exiled. Arius, Theonus, and Secundus refused to adhere to the creed, and were thus exiled to Illyria, in addition to being excommunicated. The works of Arius were ordered to be confiscated and consigned to the flames, while all persons found possessing them were to be executed. Nevertheless, the controversy continued in various parts of the empire. The creed was amended to a new version by the First Council of Constantinople in 381.